So First Republic is a bank that has just collapsed. It's now the fourth financial institution to go under in 2023, but it won't be the last. I think today we should have a look at all of the various economic bubbles that are about to burst because pending the next month, things are going to get really bad. Now, I'm, I don't take much pleasure in saying that I called this in a video a little while ago that got your stamp of approval as an economist, mm, so I video. appreciate that. Uh, that is our Wiley Coyote economy. So if anyone remembers any cartoons like Scooby-Doo or Looney Tunes, you know that moment where a cartoon character hands over the edge of the cliff and it isn't until they look down and realize they're not standing the on anything? going. Exactly, until yeah. they plummet. That's kind of where we are economically because we're just waiting for the debt bubble to pop. And I said some things specifically in here that are going to be coming up in this little report on First Republic and all of the other institutions that are going to go by the wayside very imminently. This video is free, but of course we are demonetized on YouTube, so if you fancy paying us £5 a month to keep the lights on, we would greatly appreciate it. Anyway, let's get into First Republic. So we have some reporting from the AP here. So this is the second largest bank failure in US history, and that's right behind the Washington Mutual, which collapsed at the height of the 2008 financial crash, which was then also taken over by JP Morgan mm. in some interesting circumstances. It seems like the government really likes allowing to have JP Morgan snap up these ailing institutions. Maybe they favour them for, for some reason. And it's also the fourth regional lender to collapse since... Well, to put this into perspective, this, the, the three, three of the four yeah. largest bank collapses in US history have all occurred in the last 60 days. Yes. And yet the mainstream media and the administration is telling us that everything's fine, carry on as usual. Yeah, we will have a quote from Biden later that basically oh, says, nothing yes. to panic, please disperse. But you're referring to Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, then Credit Suisse have had a bit of a hiccup, mm. and then Silvergate also, and then now this has happened. So this is the fifth atop four actual it, it's banks. It's starting to look up. like maybe something is going on. Yeah, mm. could say that. Not great. So we have a timeline of the collapse in this article. So a coalition of a dozen banks had pulled together $30 billion as a funding package for First Republic last month. So that was in April slash March. For a while, that seemed to stanch the bleeding of the deposits. This came alongside the firing of 7,200 staff to also cut costs. So at the same time, it looks like they were trying to stabilise. Last Monday, First Republic reported its first quarter results and stunned analysts and investors when it revealed that $100 billion in deposits had flowed out of the bank, most in mid-March, immediately after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature. So this was the runs that you predicted would end up happening from very wealthy people. Well, the thing is, ac across the entire banking sector at the moment, there is a, if not a bank run, there's a bank walk. Hmm. Money is just flowing out of the banking sector because they can go to a money market fund or they can go to you know federal paper and then get 4%. Yep. Or you can keep it in a bank account and you can get 0%. So, so people, every week, people are looking at that and going, oh, okay, well, why do I keep my money in the bank then? And they're just walking out. So this is, this is just an entire sector of the money is just draining out of it. Yeah, the dominoes are inevitably falling. Mm. Yeah. Um, as was the case with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, First Republic clients with large accounts were quick to pull their money out at the first sign of trouble because they've got no loyalty if they're not getting a return on their investment. So what was JP Morgan's chase role here? First Republic's 84 branches opened this Monday as branches of JP Morgan Chase, which acquired the bank's $92 billion in deposits and $203 billion in loans and other securities. The bank's shareholders are likely to be wiped out as part of this deal. JP Morgan, which has $3 trillion in assets, is so big that by law, it would not have been allowed to buy First Republic because no one bank can have more than a 10% market share of deposits in the US. But it's only because First Republic failed that the US government didn't step in and allowed JP Morgan to step in and snatch it up instead. So it's almost like they were waiting for it to fail and knew it would ahead of time for JP Morgan to swallow up this asset. So, so this is kind of the deal that we had coming out of 2008. We're going to classify a small handful of the biggest banks as too big to fail, yep. and we're going to put protections around them, but you can't get any bigger except when there's a crisis when you can buy a smaller bank. And, and in fact, this isn't even a small bank. This is like the 14th largest bank in the US by assets. Mm. So uh, w when a crisis comes along, you can buy that for pennies on the dollar. Yeah. So they are getting bigger, even though they're not supposed to. And it actually benefits them to allow the collapses to happen in conjunction with government because they buy it at a depreciated price. Well, not only that, but um, also the FDIC will basically take out the most toxic bits. Mm. So they get to buy the bit that they actually want. Yeah. for pennies on the dollar, and then the FDIC, uh, the taxpayer, gets to deal with the rest of it. It's almost like it's a slightly rigged game, <laughs> yeah. one might suggest. Yeah. The banking mm. sector, surely not. Interesting. JP Morgan expects the addition of First Republic to add $500 million to its net income per year. So that explains why they bought it then. Although it expects to incur $2 billion in costs in integrating First Republic into its operations over the next 18 months. So what's that? Four years, and it's turning a, a tidy profit for them. Yes. Hmm. 
Okay, seems like something they want to uh, uh, risk worth taking. If we go to this Reuters reporting. So JP Morgan are paying $10.6 billion to the US Federal Deposit Insurance Corp, which is the FDIC. And the deal will cost the FDIC's deposit insurance fund about $13 billion. So there's going to be an unsecured couple of billion there that taxpayers pick up. Well, also, I think the FDIC are, are running a finance line for JP Morgan to pull this deal off as well. Right. And it's, I think it's 50 billion. And it's like, well, where are they getting that money from? Because they're not, they're not supposed to have that. Yeah, well, we're going to find out later that they shouldn't really have any money at all, yes. according to Janet Yellen herself, which is quite concerning. Mm. And the, the JP Mormon chairman and CEO, which is Jamie Dimon, said, our government invited us and others to step up, and we did. Right. So the government and the JP Morgan CEO are just saying, yeah, we, we worked together on this. We, we wanted to make sure they increased their market share, even though it should be illegal were the banks still solvent and they tried to buy it. Right. Interesting. So so why did First Republic make such big losses? So if we go over to this Wall Street Journal reporting here, they blame the Federal Reserve's rapid series of interest rate increases, which led the depositors to seek better returns elsewhere in money market funds. This impacted its unsecured loans to the wealthy property buyers. And the reason they were booming, and there's I think there's a chart in here if you scroll down, John, there was a point of where they were trading much higher than JP Morgan themselves. Here we go. So the First Republic for quite some time, were trading higher than JP Morgan and Chase. And the reason was they were courting very wealthy clients, and then they paid them minimal interest and used their deposits to fund their mortgages. More deposits meant that more loans for condo projects in Manhattan or second homes in Hawaii. First Republic got back far more than these borrowers, 3.03% interest charge on the average in 2021, and then paid it out to depositors on 0.12% interest on average. And these loans also had bespoke features, so they almost never went bad. One guy, for example, lost a load of money on a Japan trip that he didn't do, and they secured yeah. him the rate of exchange so that he didn't lose all the money that he'd already transferred over. So they made a, they wrote a lot of checks they couldn't quite cash. Yeah. It, is it worth very quickly explaining that for the audience? So, so for basically, it. banks have got two, two lots of money. They've got short-term money and got long-term money. Mm. Um, the money comes into the bank short-term, which is um, you go and put your deposits in there, but you can take that out any time. And then you've got the long-term money, which is where you make your money. So you get your money here and you lend it out here to make your money. And the long-term money is things like mortgages, which mm. is you know uh, could be prepared for sort of 20 or 30 years. Now, what happened is both of these levels used to be really low. And then because interest rates have gone up so rapidly, short-term money is now expensive, mm. but long-term money is still earning you know a very low amount so it fundamentally breaks the bank's business model because they've got to they've got to bring money in at four percent and then lend it out and they're lending it out at this really low basis so of course what they've been doing is not doing that so they've been keeping the price of short-term deposits really low at, at basically zero percent and that's why all this money is walking out of the banking sector except for the big globally systemic important banks, so the, so the JP Morgans, because those guys, they also pay zero on deposits when they should be paying about 4%. And people are happy to do that because, because they know that that money is going to be protected because it's one of, the, one of the big four. So it's too big to fail. So they can get away with paying zero. But the only reason they're able to get away with zero and all these other banks are failing they can't is because of this, this protected status. Mm. So another way of looking at that is to say, OK, well, JP Morgan, they've got about 2.3 trillion in um, deposits. Um, if you should be paying 4% on that, well, so that's 90, that's 90 billion that they should be paying out. So they are effectively getting a subsidy of 90 billion by being classified as a regulatory systemically important bank. Now, if you think about that in other terms, so there's about 150 US taxpayers. So you divide 90 billion by 150, that's about 600, $600 per year is the basically the subsidy that you are kind of paying to JP Morgan if you're an American taxpayer. So Right. Yeah. What, yeah, a, what a rip off all yeah, the way down. When you're basically. getting zero percent interest on your own bank. Account. Yes, and you're getting zero as well. Right. Yes. Yeah. So so actually with First Republic Bank's model of promising these large, yeah. low interest loans and plus benefits to wealthy donors yes. was a really good idea for quite a while, but then it was precariously reliant on the yeah. the low interest money bubble, which was never going to last. So it, it this works all the time that the the clients of First Republic don't mm. realise that they can get four percent by taking their money out and going elsewhere. Yeah, and that's only possible because the way the Fed has done interest rates yes. meant that there's now no incentive to keep it in there in the first place. Yes. So they were really reliant on a, a legislator that wasn't favourable to them because they already had their favourites that they were picking and playing with. Yeah, the bank, certainly, yeah. yeah. Right, 
great. Mm. Okay. So if you had the money in these guys, um, sorry, yes. I suppose the Fed just doesn't care. At the end of 2022, the bank had 176.4 billion in deposits, 68% of which exceeded the federal deposit insurance core's $250,000 insurance limit, which meant customers were not guaranteed to get that cash back if the bank failed, which it has. Deposits accounted for 92% of the bank's funding. First Republic increased deposits 13% in 2022, but it dearly paid for them in the fourth quarter. First Republic paid out $428 million in interest on deposits, up from $20 million a year earlier, so they were just hemorrhaging money. In 2022, more than half of First Republic's loans were residential mortgages with an average interest rate of 2.89%. Rising rates shaved off some $22 billion off of their market value. So, again, writing checks they couldn't quite cash because of the economic circumstances that the Fed had created. And then they also heavily interested, invested in the tech sector, which is quite interesting, similar to Silicon Valley Bank. The bank had struck deals with companies to target their employees and staffers of Alphabet's Google, who set up an account earned a sign-up bonus of more than $2,000, said people familiar with the matter. It set up a branch inside Facebook's headquarters and routinely offered wealthy tech employees long-term mortgages at 2.5% or less. As we can see with Silicon Valley, especially considering the people pouring out of it because of all the job cuts and the fact that San Francisco is a hellhole, um, San Francisco real estate is not doing so well right now. So that's yes. also a precarious gamble. One customer was Mark Zuckerberg. In 2012, First Republic gave the Facebook founder and CEO a $5.95 million mortgage with a starting rate of 1.05%. So yeah. low percent mortgages, very expensive. As soon as your wealthy investors realize they could go elsewhere, they're just pulling all the business out. And the tech sector itself is something I mentioned in my Wiley yeah. Coyote video, because I said, Elon Musk buying Twitter and realizing that the overheads are unsustainable because it's really bloated, you're going to push lots of people out of the sector. And if that's your main clientele, not great. So that's that's a big factor. But the other thing that's just worth noting is, why does Mark, Mark Zuckerberg have a mortgage? Mm. Why do all of, Elon Musk yeah. has mortgages. Why, why do all of these billionaires have mortgages? Is it because they think that the US dollar is going to hold its value over the next few years, mm. or do they think that the money print is going to be turned on? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting yeah. point. There we go. Um, so the property bubble also is going to get way, way worse, speaking mm. of property, because the Biden administration is going for mortgage equity. I don't know if you've heard about this. Yeah, I heard about this. It was yeah. funny. For those who don't know, um, in January 2023, the Federal Housing Finance Agency announced that two major government-sponsored entities, the Federal National Mortgage Association, which is Fannie Mae, and the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, Freddie Mac, two organizations which have never been responsible for any financial crash ever, will be adjusting their single-family pricing framework starting on May the 1st. So that was yesterday, Monday. This will change the fees known as loan-level price adjustments and affect all future home buyers' mortgage rates right in the middle of the spring housing market and in the face of what many economists predict is a coming recession. With the new fees, a home buyer with a credit score of 680 or above will now have to pay a 1% LLPA fee. So if you have a good credit, you have to subsidize people in bad credit. Those who make a 15% to 20% down payment will see the biggest increase, about $40 or more on their monthly mortgage payments. In contrast, people with credit scores below 680, riskier borrowers, would receive a 1.75% discounted LLPA fee. So they're actively incentivizing you to have poor credit. So they're making people that are financially stable subsidize people who have not made good financial decisions yeah. to make sure you have property equity. I, I think you still pay a low rate if you've got better credit, but the disparity between the two yes. has been sort of warped to, yeah. to basically send the incentive signal to people good credit to buy fewer or, or, or spend less money in this way to take on less debt, and it's incentivizing people with bad credit who can't pay back to take on more debt, because you know obviously you know that has been tried before post two thousand, and it worked out so well that time. Why not try that again? Yeah, uh, something something in the back of my mind screams um, subprime mortgage crisis yes. to do with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Yes, uh, it, it's almost like someone in the Obama administration at the time should know better, but then expecting Joe Biden to know anything it, with that radical brain. It's not quite business. as blatant as it was then, but it's basically it's basically go doing the same thing again. It's just starting that process of of, of disincentivizing yeah. you know people who can actually afford loans from taking them. Yeah, and we've got a massive problem with uh, property in the UK coming up as well. So if we go on to this next one, there's a, an unheard article on the fact that since lockdown, lots of people have just stopped showing up to work in the office. They've either worked remote, so businesses can lower their overhead costs by not putting everyone in. Or if you go to London on a Friday, TfL, dead. All the transport completely empty. All the stations are empty because everyone's taking three-day weeks. Or they're working remotely, which means that they're taking basically three-day weeks. And this article here points out the fact that 
there are dire headlines everywhere you look about commercial property. So in Canada, analysts have expected a 50% decline in commercial property. In San Francisco, which we just mentioned, they've attempted to sell an empty $300 million office tower, and it just hasn't happened very well because they've um, sold for 80% less than the investors have expected. <laughs> in Britain, money is flowing into commercial property, and it's fallen precipitously. Um Vacant office space in Britain has risen by 65% in the past three years, so since the pandemic, which means that for businesses that want to expand, do things like new studios, will be great for some people. But for other people who are not capable of um, uh, of getting many people to the office and all the people that have been renting this out, that means yeah. that there's going to be a large number of real estate agents with absolutely no one to sell to. And a, and a lot of this stuff is just going to get demolished because you, yeah. your first hand, you think, okay, well, if there's lots of commercial property, I would just turn it into flats. Yeah. But it doesn't work like that no, because the, the, on there. the plumbing's all wrong and the building regs aren't, aren't the same. And basically, it costs about as much to change it to residential as it does to demolish it and start again. So, yeah, loads of this stuff is going to get demolished. Yeah, and it says in here as well, if you aren't building more of this stuff and you can't retrofit into housing... Employment and construction makes up about 5 oh, yeah. to 7% of jobs in Britain. So if the construction rate goes down, you're going to see loads of unemployment to similar levels that you saw in 2008, 2009. And the other thing is you, your local council has probably bought up loads of office space as well because they did a lot of that over the last 20 years. Didn't they Didn't they take on loads of these places to take on loads and loads of debt to buy up loads of this property as yeah. well? So if the debt bubble is going to burst, the property bubble is going to burst and yeah. inflation is running high, we're all screwed. Yeah, it's not looking good. That's why yeah. I revert to my thinking that the money printer is going to make a big comeback fairly soon. Great. Okay, mm. right. So the cycle's just going to start again. Uh, yes, except property be even more unaffordable. Oh, okay. So there is that. Okay, brilliant. So we're all living in giant Chinese ghost cities and they're all about to be pulled down around us. But yeah. We still can't get a house. Brilliant. Um, Biden has obviously come out and commented on the First Republic situation and he's given a very presidential address in the Rose Garden. He says, these actions are going to make sure that the banking system is safe and sound. While depositors are being protected, other than having to bail the bank out, shareholders are losing their investments. And critically, taxpayers are not the ones on the hook. Right. But they are. Well, they're going to be even more on the hook, because if we go to this article here from the New York Times, basically the debt ceiling is about to explode. Mm. So... Congress are currently fighting amongst themselves and it hasn't been kicked to the Senate yet and Biden's wanting to veto it. But what's happening is the GOP have been asked by the Democrats to raise the debt ceiling and the GOP has said, OK, marginally, as long as you have some spending cuts. And so they've drafted a bill and they're infighting over it. So the legislation would raise the debt ceiling into the next year in exchange for freezing spending at last year's levels for a decade, nearly 14% cuts, as well as rolling back part of Biden's landmark health, climate and tax laws. So those are the giant pork bills for for the Inflation Reduction Act, which worsened inflation and things like that, uh, imposing work requirements on social programs and expanding mining and fossil fuel production, so rolling back all of that anti-gas legislation that Biden did on day one. Even Republicans conceded that their legislation was headed nowhere. Mr. Biden has threatened to veto it, and the measure is dead on arrival in the Democratic-led Senate. Without action by Congress to raise the debt limit, which is projected to be reached as early as this summer, the US government faces a potentially catastrophic default. And by the way, in the Senate, only Joe Manchin, who is Bill Gates' personal puppet, by the way, and John Tester are the only Democrat senators that are saying, maybe we should listen to the Republicans and get around the negotiating table for this. But Biden's just saying no. So he wants to raise the yeah. debt ceiling and raise spending all at once and sees absolutely nothing wrong with this strategy. One person it's that does... So insane. One person that does see something wrong with it. If we go to the Zero Hedge articles, Jar Janet Yellen, um, do you remember that letter that was left by Gordon Brown's chancellor that says, we've got no money left? Oh, yeah, Cameron? all the money's gone, yeah. Janet Yellen's written one of those herself to the sitting administration. So she's literally said the US tre Treasury is due to run out of money on June the 1st. So if we don't do this debt ceiling, the US will default on its debt. Yeah. That seems really bad for the whole world. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen sent a letter to Congress in which she said the result of the recent slowdown in tax receipts, which has been, I think, about 35% since the last year, because mm. obviously MMT folks don't understand Laffer curves, or the fact that just sending IRS agents knocking door to door won't make up for the fact that their global corporate tax level has meant that less investing is going to happen. Um, they said the Treasury could have run out of uh, run out of money due to emergency debt limit measures. As soon as June the 1st, absent the debt ceiling deal, a revision to her previous January the 13th letter, which she said that it was unlikely that cash and extraordinary measures would be exhausted before early June. So, again, they couldn't have forecast inflation, they couldn't have forecast the fact that they're running out of money, why are you employing these people unless you're deliberately trying to demolish the dollar? 
boggles the mind. Yellen wrote, if Congress fails to increase the debt limit, it would cause a severe hardship to American families, harm our global leadership position, as if you haven't been doing that already, and raise questions about our ability to defend our national security interests. During the first calendar quarter of 2023, the Treasury borrowed $657 billion and ended the quarter with a cash balance of $178 billion. This is a huge difference from the forecast made just three months ago, in January 2023, when the Treasury had estimated a borrowing of $932 billion and assumed an end-of-March cash balance of $500 billion. So they're coming up just over $300 billion short. Yeah. Seems to be... Well, the US is going to default, and it's either going to default by it doesn't pay the interest on its bonds, mm. so a, 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 no, a, nom- a nominal default, or it's going to default by printing loads of money and those bonds not being worth anything. So it's 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 going to it's going to default one way. It's, it's only a question of how that default happens. Yeah. So rather than bite the bullet and reduce spending and reduce money oh, no, printing, obviously you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. of course there's too many entitlement programs on the line, and you wouldn't get mm. votes that way in the most safe and secure elections ever. So what a lot of people are worrying about with this collapse being precipitated is the fact that this will be a great time for if all of your banks collapse to go don't worry we've secured your deposits all you've got to do is sign up to federal government cryptocurrency.com and yeah. all of your money's been transferred into there plus a sign up bonus because we can just print money out of yeah. the air right about now and i'm sure that would just be a conspiracy theory if as we've already heard from the ceo of jp morgan chase the government weren't working with the banks to coordinate some kind of merger. Because if we go over to this Reuters reporting, JP Morgan bought First Republic on Monday in a government auction, culminating weeks of failed rescue attempts and aborted discussions involving some of the most powerful Wall Street executives and US officials. Right, so they saw this total collapse coming from quite a while away. So they were totally lying when they said that there's going to be no bank collapse. And they knew that JP Morgan couldn't snatch it up until they'd failed spectacularly. And so they just waited to allow their preferred partner to snatch this up. So is this going to be replicated for all the other banks that are going to be collapsing regionally? Well, it sort of looks that way because yeah, they're, they're, not, they're basically not doing anything differently. They're just continuing the same formula, which is resulting in bank collapse. Yeah. So something has to give. So it's, it's either going to be a continual run of more and more bank collapses mm. or something fundamentally changes, you know, a, a drastic drop in interest rates and money printing, but that will just completely blow inflation through the roof. Yeah. So so it's, it's, they, they basically have no good options from here. And, you know, I don't know if they are using this. I mean, I know they want the CBDC. Yeah. Whether they're using this as a play for it right now, whether the technology is ready behind the scenes, I have no idea. But... It fits. It, it fits the scenario. Well, it seems that they've had this in the works for a little while, because we go over to this next one, and I always love like coming back to this document. This is the w, uh, World Economic Forum's blueprint for digital identity. And if you just keep scrolling down, John, there should be a uh, page here of where they have all their partners. Um, you can pause, just go up. There oh, we there go. go. Perfect, yeah. So that's involved in this is the White House Treasury Department and also J.P. Okay. Morgan Chase. As long as oh, look, there they are. Yeah, along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the UK government. So it seems they've been working on at least digital identity and digital currency for quite some time. And the most convenient time would be when all of their competitors seem to be merging into one and lots of people were worried about losing their deposits to incentivize them to sign up to this particular program. So mm. not not excellent, but I thought I'd end on some good news. Global financial collapse would at least bring something good from fun. Um, oh, yes. Vice are uh, going bankrupt. So at least one leftist rag is is running out of money. It was once considered one of the most successful new startups of all time when investors valued it at 5.7 billion in 2017, and since wokeness happened, it's now struggling to sell itself for more than 1 billion for the entire enterprise that includes all its documentaries and news. And I just thought I'd finish on the the glee of President Giga Chad. This is President Bukele of El Salvador who has tweeted out, "It seems like Soros's money also run out." Now, that's great. I'm glad we're all smiles. Just a shame the entire financial sector is going the same way, I suppose. So um, mm. get used to roasting cats, everyone. We hope you enjoyed that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters. If you enjoyed, you can go and get the full podcast for free on our website. And also you can pay us as little as £5 a month to get access to all of our premium content, such as the Contemplation series, this episode where Josh discusses with Stelios whether or not cities are having an impact on our psychology and politics. If you want to find out all of the content that we're putting out, you can follow us at at lotuseaters underscore com on Twitter and Getter. Until next time, goodbye.